Welcome to Research Jam number 17. We have lots of submissions today, trying to get through seven presentations. For those who are watching the recording, you might only see six because one opted out. But let's get started. First, we have Stone Tao. Cool. Um, yeah, my name is Stone. Um, I'm a PhD student at UCSD right now, um, but I'll skip most of it about me. You can find that online. Today, I kind of want to just put out feelers, I guess, for an idea I've been thinking about recently uh, along the idea of basically how can we improve existing game benchmarks? Basically, how do we move on from Atari uh, in some sense? And I'll explain basically. So the kind of main premise here is a general goal for a lot of RL problems and kind of just uh, autonomous learning in general is how complex of a problem can we tackle and what is the frontier right now, right? How do we evaluate our frontier? This is a big problem in LLM already, but I think it's already a growing problem within RLO, whether it's robotics or games. And so the big question is how do we measure the capabilities of your algorithm via someone else's and how do we know they've done well? And so it seems like many past breakthrough papers that I'll show you later, often will claim some kind of beyond human performance or emergence capabilities, but I kind of, I want to make the counterclaim that these claims are very subjective in some sense and hard to reproduce. So as an example, there are kind of three very popular kind of, there's a very popular AlphaGo paper, but the way they evaluate their beyond human level capabilities is they play the world's best Go player. Uh, Atari, you can pair against basically human generated high scores and then OpenAI's hide and seek paper from a while back where they had trained a multi-agent AI to play hide and seek and learn supposedly surprising behaviors um, that was qualitatively analyzed. So you have playing a human player, comparing against past demonstrations, and then qualitative analysis. But there's a couple of problems. The first one is a scaling pitfall. You can ask yourself a number of questions. You'll notice a lot of them don't quite work. Um, you can't play Lisa Dole every day. <laughs> Uh, for Atari benchmark, Atari has also become a little bit saturated. And also, you don't know who generated a human scores. It could be a baby playing it. So are you really beating humans? We don't know. Uh, and I actually don't know how the demonstrations were generated. And then the third one with hide and seek paper, uh, which I tend to have a little issue with, is whenever people use the words emergent or surprising behavior, is never well-defined. It's only based on qualitative analysis. You'll notice a lot of times in the that old paper, it's a little bit outdated now, but they'll claim a lot of things that look emergent, but is it truly emergent? How do we know that? That's something we want to evaluate at scale in a more reliable way and quantitatively. Another set of pitfalls I think can happen is just evaluation in general. For example, testing on the game of Go is a little bit saturated in the sense of you're kind of optimizing, let's say, off of Go for one game. Now, obviously there's papers recently that uh, try to play, uh, use that whole system to play multiple games. But as an example, you don't want to like test just on one single game constantly. And then many of these kind of saturated games, when you beat humans, it's sort of meaningless, right? If your algorithm is beating humans on this benchmark all the time already, like you've already beaten all the Atari games pretty well. Any additional improvements are basically improvements on sample efficiency. And I, in my opinion, I think if you're not making significant sample efficiency improvements, any improvements you make are very minimal. And I think this doesn't push I guess, the edge of our own research as far as you can. In other games like hide and seek, there isn't really any human data to compare against. And so you're doing, only doing qualitative analysis instead of quantitative analysis. So the kind of frequent problem I find, um, you'll see a lot of papers will say, uh, DeepMind had a paper called Human Time Scale Adaptation, very cool meta-learning RL paper, but human time scale is very opaque in a sense, one, they don't exactly open source their data. And two, again, it's also a little bit qualitative analysis in terms of like, what videos they shared with the rest of the research community of saying, this is what a human demonstration looks like. And then the second thing is like, for example, the OpenAI's hide and seek paper, they'll claim there's emergent tool use, but what is emergent? Can we define that quantitatively? And then if, again, a lot of these kind of existing game benchmarks are starting to lack difficulty. Algorithms are becoming so powerful that I think Atari is, at least in my opinion, has become less interesting to benchmark on. And so this is kind of, introduces what I call like a scaling problem of complex benchmarks. We have a lot of very interesting environments that people like to test on now, which is like Minecraft or NetHack. These are two very, very complicated environments that many um, uh, very complicated multi-agent environments also that have human level data, but they're very hard to scale to evaluate against. It's observations very significant. So how do we address scaling? And so one solution is trying to massively crowdsource code. Uh, we basically want to run a giant AI competition, a program competition where people can like submit code of bots. And this has been done successfully very uh, in the past. And so these code, these rule-based bots 
can serve as a proxy for human level performance as opposed to stale data sets or qualitative analysis. And so in the past, I've helped run some competitions. I've done this before. We have had garnered a lot of top submissions by basically designing competitions for humans and AI. What we mean by designing for humans or designing competitions that garner a lot of sub submissions from human-based players, um, people who aren't using RL. But we also want to design a benchmark that's good for research. So we want to answer different questions that we are interested in, um, make it difficult, and raise the frontier of RL research we can do. And so combining these together, we can kind of get diversity and quantity in data, whether it's through online simulation with potentially gpu parallelized environments, and also uh, supporting RL and imitation learning at scale, because now we have bots you compare against constantly. Um, these are top best bots submitted by some of the best competitors in the world. Um, and so now you have the human level proxy. I did rush a little bit, but there's a bunch of open problems I'm interested in, which is like, uh, what kind of questions do we want to answer in which we can crowdsource these policies? Um, and what is the best way to kind of work towards building these human and AI kind of centered competitions to push in this direction? So yeah, any questions, thoughts, comments? Awesome, thanks, Dan. I think we have time for one question, right? Maybe no questions. Um, we will have the um, discussion rooms in Discord afterwards, immediately afterwards. So. If you want to chat at more length with Stone about this idea, um, pop over to room number one, I think, which has Stone's name. So yeah, th thanks for presenting, Stone. Thank you. Next, we have Amitresa yeah. presenting an idea about U-turn diffusion. Hello, everybody. My name is Hamid Reza. I'm a PhD student in mathematics at the University of Arizona. And I'm going to talk about other recent stuff about diffusion models. First, uh, let's have a very brief introduction about what is a score diffusion model and how it works. In a score diffusion models, we have an input data and we add noise to this input data, such as this dark image, in very small steps until this image totally disappear and turn into pure noise. And our goal is to Burst this dynamic from pure noise and run it for some time until we arrive to the to the data distribution. But since it is a stochastic dynamic here, we model the forward process with a stochastic differential equation with a drift term and diffusion term. We cannot just simply put a minus t and reverse the dynamic like the ordinary differential equation. In order to reverse the dynamic in a way that they have the same marginals as the forward dynamics, we need to add this term, the gradient of log probability density, which is known as the score function in the machine learning community. So we run the forward dynamics for multiple images in our data set and use a neural network to approximate this score function and based on learning this neural network, then we sample from noise, in this case, which is a Gaussian distribution, and run this stochastic different backward stochastic differential equation for a long time. And then we arrive to our data distribution, x0. And the downside of diffusion model is that you need to do a lot of, uh, you need to run this backward equation for a very long time, sometimes 1,000 or 2,000 steps to achieve a very good image. Here, we argue that we do not need uh, to go to the pure noise. And if we stop some certain level and then reverse the dynamic at that, at that, at that time, we can also achieve better quality and diverse images. So here, this is our proposal. First, we have an input image, then we run it for a certain amount of time and we arrive at a noisy version of the images. Then we initialize the backward dynamic instead of T capital at some other time T and then reverse the dynamic until time T zero. For example, in this picture, we did it for t equal to 50. We have a butterfly image. We run the forward dynamic for 50 times, and we arrive at a noisy version of the image. 
then we use this noisy version of the image as the initial input for the reverse dynamics and reverse the and reverse the backward dynamics for 50 times here we see that for 50 times it wasn't it, it does not uh, produce new images and we tried it for different time for example 300 500 but for, for example 650 at this time it starts to generate uh, new images which are totally different from the original images uh, and uh, we see that uh, it saves us a lot of time instead of going to 1000 steps from pure noise and starts from that time but the question here is that how do we choose uh, the time t for reverting the dynamics uh, in the paper we propose we propose multiple test time but here we i just mentioned one of them here we introduce the norm of the score function normalized with the input data and when we plot the norm of score function with the input, with respect to the input data, for example, consider the orange line, after some times it starts to flatten. And when it starts to flatten, it is exactly the time when our stochastic dynamic, backward stochastic dynamics starts to generate new samples. And it is the best time to revert the dynamics. Here we have uh, we tested for uh, three different noising schedules. For example, when we add a noise to the image, we follow a protocol. And this protocol here, for example, linear is based on the linear sigmoid or cosine. And we, in the paper, and we tried the different uh, testing scenarios for these uh, three different schedulers. That's all, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Hamid Reza. Anyone have a question? We have time for probably one. Looks like you've, you've done most of the work and looks like it works. What's the next step? Because this is a platform where you ask or invite collaborators and contribute to this work. I'm happy if somebody has any interest in this stuff. But uh, there is also some other things in the original paper on archive. Uh, you can see it uh, because of lack of time. I did not mention all of them. Look forward to chatting more in the Discord room. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Agam and Daikanta. If you both are here, hey Agam. So yeah, hey everyone. I'm Agam. I'm an undergraduate student at uh, UW Madison and. Yeah, really excited to be here. This is my first time here. So I'm here to talk about a recent work on reprogramming under constraints, which is a joint work with Diganta, who's on the call, Bharat and Pinyu Chen from the MIT IBM Watson lab. And in this work, we basically study the effect of model and data sparsity on the transfer learning paradigm. Um, and we specifically focus on the aspects of performance as well as calibration. So let me begin with uh, lottery tickets. So lottery tickets are basically sparse subnetworks which are embedded within these larger over-parameterized parent networks. And the good part about them is that they often show similar or better performance compared to the original model, or uh, given that they're retrained with the same initial parameterization. And why this is good is that it allows for cheaper inference and training because of the compressed size and also since you're uh, technically getting rid of this over-parameterization to some extent, uh, sparsifying the model, it also acts as an implicit regularizer. So what we are interested in uh, from these lottery tickets was how, how would these lottery tickets work under the transfer learning paradigm and how would the calibration of the transfer model look like in terms of the reliability and also along with the model sparsity constraint that already exists here, how would adding a data sparsity constraint in specific the low data regime few short adaptation, how would that affect um, the performance? So let us briefly revisit the uh, various transfer learning paradigms, the popular ones today. So let's say uh, I have a model that was pre-trained on some source data set, and now I'm using it to adapt it to a new task on some target data set. So we are usually familiar with uh, fine tuning and linear probing. 
in fine tuning, you can back propagate through the entire model's weights to update them and learn a new representation. And in linear probing, you're basically training a linear classifier head on top of this pre-trained model. And recently, a more I think uh, a method that has become more popular is visual prompting, where you basically take your image and then you surround it with this pixelated noise around it. And when you back propagate, you're only updating this pixelated noise around this image of yours. And once you have the best representation of that pixelated noise, uh, during test time, you basically append this noise on the outside of uh, each of your test images, and that's how you perform inference. And one natural question is that the source and target data set labels may not be the same. So how does the output work? So usually the ways to like hard code map the labels of your source data set and target data set in order to get uh, the predictions. So this was a recent work in CVPR 2022, which studies how well sparse image models transfer. And here they focus on uh, linear probing and full fine tuning. And they basically look at various different pruning methods and the models obtained from them and try to understand how they transfer in this transfer learning paradigms. And what we were interested in from this paper uh, was that firstly, how would this scale to visual prompting? Second, since uh, they study this um, effect only at like a dense 90% sparsity and 80% sparsity, we were interested more in like a, a comprehensive sparsity state analysis. So going all the way from, uh, I think I had it here. So if you see this figure on the right side, it goes all the way from the dense model to 79% remaining weights all the way down up to almost 10% remaining weights. Yeah, and lastly, like I mentioned before, combining this with the data sparsity constraint. So to highlight our key contributions, we explore two axes of sparsities. One is model sparsity, which is lottery tickets. And the second is data sparsity, which is uh, how the few short adaptation combined with the model sparsity or just the dense model in general would make the transfer for learning performance specifically for linear probing and visual prompting. We also look at calibration to understand how reliably these models can be transferred. And finally, we'll categorize our study based on different case studies on based on uh, what outcome we see. So going over the transfer learning performance, we see two main case studies. Um, the first one is where Lottery tickets hurt overall on transferring compared to the dense model. So the plots that you see here on the right side are basically the difference between the dense model performance and the lottery ticket performance. And you see that overall the dense model almost always is outperforming the lottery ticket. And we also noticed that visual prompting actually hurts the transfer learning performance a bit more compared to linear probing. And the affected data sets in this case were CIFAR 10, Caltech 101, and Oxford Pets. The second case study was where lottery tickets seem to hurt in some cases, but not in all. And you can see like a mixed pattern here. Sometimes the dense one is better, and sometimes the lottery tickets are better. And the data sets that were affected in this way were SVHM, GTS, RV, and FLARS 102. There were some other outlier cases, which I'll skip here in the interest of time. But um, these were the two main uh, patterns that we see. Finally, moving on to the calibration, we noticed three interesting patterns. Hey, One is that- We're almost the, at time. Um, just yes, yes. wrap up mm -hmm. soon. Thanks. Awesome. Yes. So the uh, expected calibration error of lottery tickets is actually much greater for, uh, for lottery tickets compared to the dense models. And also we noticed a very drastic increase in the expected calibration error of uh, linear probe traffic transferred models compared to visual prompting. So the key takeaways are despite similar transfer, despite similar performance of lottery tickets on these upstream tasks, they don't necessarily generalize to the transfer learning uh, regime. And one other thing is that the ECE of these visual prompted transferred models are much better than the ones that are linear probed. And this is something we believe can be exploited and looked at further in future studies. Yeah, uh, any questions, comments, or feedback? Thanks, Agam. Great presentation. Um, I think we should defer questions to Discord afterward because we're out of time. But thank you for the presentation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
Next up, we have Vishnu. Vishnu. Hey. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Razan, for the invitation. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, understanding a uh, type of protein, intrinsically disordered proteins, with compositional reasoning. So, uh, what are IDPs? Well, when you think of proteins, you may think of them having very precise three-dimensional structure, like folded origami or uh, tightly wound balls of yarn. But actually, 30% of proteins encode some kind of disorder, and they're more like cooked spaghetti. They lack um, defined structure, they're very flexible, uh, and it's hard to observe them. So for many single cell or single molecule experiments, you can immobilize them on a glass surface, and you can see what happens uh, for an extended period of time and observe their dynamics. But for flexible systems, it's, it's really hard. It could perturb the landscape of the molecule. Um, but overall, why do we want to study um, IDPs? Well, um, they have been implicated in uh, the formation of a certain physiological uh, phenomenon in the body. For example, um, the tau protein uh, has been shown to form uh, in disorder state neurofibrillary tangles inside neurons. And that's a key characteristic that indicates the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, the aggregation of several disordered proteins can trigger a cascade of several pathological processes. So uh, how do we prevent this? Uh, well, one is we can prevent the aggregation or we can clear the aggregates from the brain. And from a machine learning context, uh, it's much easier to look at, uh, can we understand the, the conformational dynamics, the solubility, several other attributes, even yeah. aggregation propensity, and overall predict the behavior of IDPs in the context of larger systems. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal of, of my talk. Um, for a data set, and, uh, we've been aggregating data from PDBind, DisProd, MobbyDB, kind of um, ensuring that we comprehensively represent uh, both structured proteins and IDPs. And uh, we've also been considering, haven't tried yet, but data augmentation techniques using um, AlphaFold, for example, RL-based approaches. And uh, I, I can talk more about the data set in the discussion section, but uh, yeah, then we just embed uh, amino acid sequences, um, and each amino acid is just mapped to a unique dense vector. Um, we've also been uh, considering using uh, some sort of transfer learning approaches where we can leverage pre-trained embeddings from other large protein data sets and just fine tune them for the IDP task, where we look at very specific physiochemical parameters, hydrophobicity, charge distribution, and, and so on. Um, and then we use a combination of convolutional and uh, LSTM layers. We've used convolutional layers with uh, filters of three, five, or seven amino acid uh, lengths. And we typically target the, the lengths of the IDP motifs or where the interaction domains may occur um, using very low activation function and dropout as well. Uh, so for the LSTM layers, it's a uh, bidirectional LSTM. I'll just uh, capturing uh, both forward and backward dependencies in the sequence. And attention is particularly beneficial here because IDPs have specific regions of highly functional relevance uh, where they may interact with, with its own sequence or with other sequences. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for uh, future work, uh, we've been looking at uh, trying to see, uh, can we um, uh, create or generate uh, FRET histograms, which are uh, basically protein structure uh, diagrams um, our predictions? And can we build a tool for biochemists to uh, visualize heat maps uh, over an IDP sequence and visualize where there's a propensity for aggregation or interaction? Um, yeah, also looking at just building larger data sets uh, with perhaps synthetic data and involving more modalities like X-ray crystallography. But um, yeah, uh, I guess I, in the interest of time, I, I went really fast. Happy to go over any details later on. Can I ask you about your background? Are you a um, student studying the biology or are you the machine learning student trying to bring ML into proteins? I uh, worked in the Stanford Vision Learning Lab. So yeah, very much uh, worked on a compositional reasoning approaches and like visual and uh, natural language based approaches. And uh, recently got into the, the biochemistry part when I was invited to uh, organize the, or be part of the P program committee on the ML for Computational Biology Conference. And yeah, after three years working at the conference, I've been seeing a lot of uh, interesting work on proteins and 
uh, working with AlphaFold is pretty accessible online. So I've just been iterating on that. So uh, a question as like a total layman, um, can we tell which part is the IDP just from looking at it? Can humans tell? Yes, based on the uh, time series data, you'll be able to tell. Um, on the structure of the protein itself, it's hard to know if you just have a an image of the sequence, whether uh, it's disordered or not. Uh, but in terms of terminology, we consider the whole protein to be disordered, and certain regions have a propensity to interact. I see. So characterizing which sequence is irregular, that problem is already solved. But yes. now it's more like linking it to the eventual disease. More so trying to see how that disordered region interacts with other disordered regions of the IDP or other proteins or pretty much anything else in the, in the cell. Cool. Um, thank you so much. Thank Thanks, Vishu. Yeah. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Sure. One thing I'm curious about, you laid out a research trajectory. What do you think will be the most difficult part of that, of that trajectory? Like, What's the thing you're going to have to accomplish that'll be, that you're not sure whether it'll work? Mm. Uh, I think uh, using synthetic data, it's going to be hard. AlphaFold also experienced some uh, issues here where the predicted uh, protein formations may not be biologically relevant or even correct. So I, I feel like there's scope here for like uh, involving logic or some sort of rule-based uh, approaches, perhaps like logistic circuits is something I've been looking at from UCLA. Uh, that you could just use to enforce certain key biological per parameters that cannot be violated. Cool. Let's all thank Vishnu for presenting. Cool. Thank you. Next up, we have Parnian. Um, another biospace talk. Well, nice to meet you, everybody. Let me. So I'm not going to talk about the research today. I will talk about the organization that I'm involved with and also looking for potential collaboration in that regard as well. So I'm part of the organization called Nuclei. Uh, it's a student-run organization um, that is nonprofit and is uh, open like to all, and they are educational-based. Nuclei started in 2019 and uh, at MIT and Harvard as like a part of like a bio a club, and um, they have a program called Activator that helps student-run biotech startup. And they quickly expanded into many different, they have an activated program as their core, but also they have uh, running series of like workshop lectures, career development courses, networking events, and also lectures. They nucleate, uh, as I mentioned, quickly expanded since 2019, and they are um, involved with over 500 students, and they represent in 28 region globally and represent over 122 institutions. Last year, I helped building the Nuclear Seattle chapter, and this year I'm more involved in two different initiatives within the Nuclear. And just for um, some ideas here, uh, the companies that went to Nuclear and formed to Nuclear raised over 300 million um, in collectively, and they also created 200 jobs, and also, we already had one acquisition, and those are list of some of the companies that went through Nuclear Program. Those are more uh, kind of like information. For our leadership team member that they are running Nuclear, those are all like from various different country like places, and they're all like highly motivated individuals that are put together and running Nuclear. Some in New York, some in Boston, some in uh, San Diego and Texas, like from all around the world. We also have like a very good industry partners. We're working with like those are our like uh, corporate partners uh, working with Genentech, Eli Lilly, uh, Millipore Signal. Signal also, uh, we have uh, philanthropic partners such as like Schmidt Futures, and also VC partners too. So the reason I'm here because I'm um, trying to organize AI in biotech. I uh, talk to you all about Nuclear now. I want to talk about what I'm trying to do there. Um, I'm planning to organize a workshop series, educate aspiring biotech leaders to learn about the latest state of AI system and tools. And the goal is like, how can they uh, think about um, like when I started, I was doing machine learning myself five years ago, but when I entered into biology, I recognized um, how the field is like lacking. Um, as unless you're working in like a computational biologist directly, a lack of like understanding about AI system and tools. And that is my hope 
in the workshop series. We are planning to cover four topics, generative AI for drug design, AI for protein design, robotic automation, CRO, and data management and regulatory. Um, and we are planning to have uh, different activities. We are um, having the expert to give a talk about those topics, as well as mentors that um, students and also startup, they can um, host one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Uh, we also put together a resource page uh, for those topics. So they have a better overview of like understanding what are the state of art, like for example, papers, publications, tutorials in that general area. And also we are planning to have a, um, like a teach them more about how they can integrate those like AI system and tools within their organization. This is our general time timeline. We're looking for like a team build building and uh, then we are forming with partnership. We are planning to have a like, multiple partnership with industry as well as uh, we go into the interviews with the expert and then um, we have a mentorship in um, February and we are planning to launch in mid January and our, all our talks and everything and resource page are going to be uh, publicly available uh, and then we are planning to in October and November building the resource page about those topics essentially and I would I'm looking for student volunteers um, if you're not a student that's fine too um, and we're also looking for domain experts as I mentioned to you in those areas and the benefit for you is that you engage in leadership activity and you will connect with wonderful community, as well as um, building a strong connections with the workshop sponsor and contribute in a developing the research page. Um, I have a QR code. If you're interested, you can um, scan that and send you to the sign up form as well as you can email me as well. If you have any question, please um, ask. Thank you. Thanks, Bernian. Um, interesting new effort. FYI, I just made, I saw you requested a channel for channel for this in Discord. So we made the uh, bio AI interest group channel in case you want to use that. Oh, that would be awesome. Thanks. Um, are you thinking of allocating this workshop with um, a major conference? Because that's what things are done in machine learning. But then in your case, I wonder if we would be co-locating it with a bio conference and attract AI experts there as well. Um. That's not something I've been thinking about, but that could be a good potential to see if it can make even partner with a conference. I can chat with you afterwards to see, explore that possibilities. Yeah, co-locating with conferences are nice because people are already going and they're just going to be easier for them to commit to attending a different another workshop. Yeah, if you're doing it with ML conferences, I have experience on how to propose workshops there, but with bioconference, I have less that we can figure out together yeah we're we'll looking ideally for intersections left those too so I'm sure there are plenty of conferences and mo uh, bio well thank you so much for letting me present here and if anyone is interested um please reach out we also have a room for parnian at discord if anyone wants to chat after this with that we'll, we will stop recording because our last speaker opted out